What's going on, everybody? We're going to give a few minutes so people get in the, get in the building. People stop. I see you slapping your hands, Brian. I hear you slapping your hands. Oh, I did that last you know, time. time. We go like this. And you can just hear it. Oh, man. Remember when we posted on YouTube? We could hear this tap tap. I'm like, what is that? I hope your wife's <laughs> laughing at you. And it was me. This is like the third time I did that. <laughs> All right, we're going to give about a minute, 30 seconds. Hope you guys ready for some value today. In about 30 more seconds. See who else can creep up in here. What's up, everybody? My wife told me to smile. <laughs> <laughs> hey, thank you guys so much for showing up today. Today, we're leveling up in tech with Threat Connect. I am your host, Broadus Palmer. I'm founder and CEO of Level Up in Tech. And I want to introduce my co-host, Brian Widger. What up? What's up? What's up? What's up? Y'all know who I am probably by now. Everybody looks like they've probably been in here before. But uh, I'm Brian Witcher, Director of Coaching and Development here at Level Up in Tech and DevOps Engineer at Threat Connect. So I'm playing dual role today. Welcome, everybody. Welcome, welcome. Now, before I introduce these two special guests, hey, hey, look, just give me a TC in the comments if you guys are ready for some value today. I want to see some TCs. TC, TC, give me some TCs. Come on now, get the TCs up there. I mean, <laughs> our, our branding and marketing people are just crying and they don't know why right now. <laughs> <laughs> so, look, I want to introduce two special guests that's helping change the world with a great company called Threat Connect. First, I want to introduce Susie Choi, who is recruiting manager at Threat Connect. Hey, Susie, go ahead and introduce yourself a little bit about yourself and something interesting, if you don't mind. Sounds good. (laughs) Um, Hi, everyone. My name's Susie. I am the recruiting manager here at Threat Connect. Um, I actually started up the recruiting department here, so it was a great opportunity to kind of bring in new change, ways I want to do stuff in the recruiting department here. So it's been a lot of fun. Fun fact, I have not put on makeup in a very long time. Um, <laughs> I did put it on for this. Um, it's, gotten, it's funny, it's gotten to a point with the pandemic where before or pre-pandemic, I would put on makeup, never go outside without it. Now I'm on company meetings, literally interviews with candidates with no makeup. <laughs> so... Little little special present for you guys today. We appreciate you coming on to the show and ready to drop those gems on their heads. Thank so next we have we have Justin Joplin, who is director of DevOps at Threat Connect. What's up, Justin? Tell the people about yourself, brother. 
Well, how's it going, guys? Uh, my name is Justin Joplin. Uh, as Broadus said, uh, I'm the director of DevOps at Threat Connect. I have uh, been leading the DevOps team for uh, about two years now. I uh, was our DevOps engineer for about a year before that. And let's see, a random interesting fact about me, I am a huge Lego aficionado. Um, you can actually see right off the corner of my screen. That's a small part of my collection, about 24,000 pieces all told. So oh, wow. lots and lots and lots of time to put things together and take them apart and just a lot of fun with that. <laughs> wow, that's very interesting, man. So what, what the Legos do is just help you uh, get your brain used to solving complex problems? Uh, quite the opposite, actually. Uh, okay. I use my brain so much during the day and it's just so much you know complication that I've got to juggle when I get to the end of the day um, just being able to sit down and follow a picture book of you know put this piece into this piece and and uh, follow it along for you know a couple hours it's the best thing ever uh, I see a question in the chat there my most exciting build I have <laughs> to say the most recent one that I got um, a little present for myself for Christmas it's the city build um, it's a, it's a little Lego shop with a bakery and a coffee shop and all kinds of stuff like that. Um, it's one of their uh, creator series. So I'm, I'm looking forward to getting some more of those uh, coming up in the future for sure. That's dope, man. That's very dope. So it makes me think like maybe I should just do something again. I'm like, cause I'm all, I'm like this all day. So, you know, it's definitely uh, great to take a mental break. So, um, speaking of breaks, I'm going to give you guys, uh, just a, a few minutes if you want to to talk about Threat Connect and talk about your mission and how you guys are impacting the world and changing DevOps and, and security as well. So, Susie, I'll let you uh, go first. Ladies first, if you don't mind. Oh, thank you very much. Um, so, at TC Threat Connect, um, committed and highly energized employees are just really crucial to any type of solution oriented team that we have here. So, for new employees or possible candidates that want to join Threat Connect, this is a great opportunity to write yourself into like, the history of a transformational security company um, to prove yourself and to others that you have the right stuff to finally put cybersecurity on a better trajectory. And then we are basically, not basically, we are giving you know young engineers an opportunity to be part of like a modern day shot to the moon per se. So... <laughs> so Justin, do you have anything to add to your mission as far as what do you do and where do you see uh, Threat Connect making an impact? Uh, honestly, the biggest thing that, that we do on the DevOps team is to enable our clients and our customers to um, be successful in their security operations. Um, I think the biggest thing that we do is, you know, we maintain a, a, a stable, uh, well-supported platform. Um, that, it, like I said, it just enables our customers to be able to fend off. I mean, we've got customers in governments and healthcare, uh, you know, medical facilities, um, you know, in all of these different industries that are absolutely vital uh, given the current situation and just the ways that we help them to be able to leverage their existing infrastructure, their existing security tools, their existing team members. Um, I think that that's absolutely, uh, I think that's absolutely important to, you know, just keeping the digital world more secure. Yeah, I agree with you. So now we got the mission and how you guys are making an impact out of the way. We're ready to get to it. I know everybody ready for the gym. They ready for the, the, the value. And people want to know how or what does it take for them to be a, a DevOps engineer at Threat Connect. So first question to you guys. So as we know, in the industry is really exploding, especially 2020. Uh, allow companies to adapt cloud and even, well, force companies to adapt cloud and some adapt it quickly. So, which means there are a lot of developing uh, engineers that are looking to get into this industry. Uh, we know as, as far as Level Up in Tech, we had a lot of people coming from all walks of life wanting a stabilized career and, and a financial rewarding career as well and the challenge of just being able to do something new. Um, tell us more about how Threat Connect is stepping up to the plate, giving value, and possibly picking up that develop, developing talent and, and help you guys change the world. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I think one of the things that um, we do especially is we try to find individuals that are some of more junior in their career. Um, as you very much highlighted, um, DevOps as a career can take you a long ways financially. 
Um, you can especially see this in you know a bunch of job boards, especially for you know companies in your, your places like New York or Boston mm-hmm. or Chicago, especially your heavy financial firms, um, you know your cryptocurrencies and things like that. Um, we take the approach that we would prefer to bring on someone that is more junior, um, where we can really get um, put good value into them, where we can help them to grow and develop good practices as engineers. Um, you know, one of the things we've been excited about with Bryant is is helping him to transition from his prior career into becoming a DevOps engineer. Um, I think that we have a good mentorship in pl- a good mentorship in place that really enables. Um, some of our more junior members to become more established, to develop good habits, um, good troubleshooting habits, uh, good uh, collaborative habits. Um, And I think all of those uh, in general are are just really, really what it takes to become an effective DevOps engineer. Great. Susan, you got anything to add? Ditto to what Justin said. He's the pro. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, and, and, you know, I can definitely add a little bit from being on the team, what, going on three weeks now, um, I think one of the most important things um, that I've learned is that, you know, the the members of the team, we come from different backgrounds, different experience levels. Um, you know, I've been heavy in the cloud and Terraform and, and, you know, some of our newer employees haven't. You know what I mean? But what we do is we're able to merge that experience together. And, you know, Justin says, hey, look, Brian, I want you to do a Python project. And I hold my head. You know, I can I can, you know, call up to my, my teammate, Ethan or, or, or Jimmy, and they will be like, hey, man, I can help you. It's not a problem. This is how I think about the processes that I go through. And what it does as a new engineer for me is it helps me to think like the senior engineers think. Um, and we really kind of collaborate. I mean, I just finished a, a research on Terraform. So, um, you know, we came together, we had a group discussion and I know a lot of people from the arena I came from, which was law enforcement management, wasn't necessarily receptive of changing their mind all the time. Right. And I remember Justin this week said, I think you all have changed my mind, you know, about <laughs> something this week. Um, and that was a, you know, a breath of fresh air for us and the team. And I know he doesn't know, but we DM'd about it and was like, man, I can't believe we did it. You know what I mean? Um, you know, we changed his mind. So, um, you know, it's been great to be a part of that team. I just wanted to say that. Um, but you have to have an open mind um, and you have to be able to soak in a lot of information because the first week is a lot of information. Right. It is a lot of what do they call this? Where is this at? What are they talking about when they refer to this? And it really takes you about two weeks, I've found, to really be like, all right, the stress and anxiety is gone. This is what it takes to be a DevOps engineer. This is what I need to work on. And this is how I'm going to move forward. I'd actually like to piggyback off of what Brian has said. One of the most one of the most consistent qualities that I have seen in, a, in an engineer in general, uh, and not just a DevOps engineer, but any engineering uh, profession at all whatsoever, is the ability to change your mind, the willingness to change your mind depending on what the data says. Any scientist, any engineer, any technician, anyone in a technical field will tell you that if you don't have the ability to be flexible in your opinions and in your perspectives, you're going to fail. We, I, I explicitly tell my team that there are a million different ways, there are a million different technical solutions to any problem. Out, my role as the manager of the team is to take all of the information that these members bring to me, synthesize that, and collaboratively lead everyone to a single unified decision and to do my best to make sure that we're walking in the same direction in that role. Um, and if I'm not willing to practice what I preach, then I'm failing as a manager. Yeah, That's to awesome. kind of pick you up back off of all of them. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Now I have something to say. Well, Brian is also definitely proof as, you know, he is one of your hosts and he is also talking to all of y'all. And I know he wouldn't lie to you guys, but just from his own personal experience, you have proof here that you have the capability to be open minded or if you have the open mindedness, you have the capability to learn new skills. It's a very collaborative type of environment where people won't just shut you down and be like, no, that's not part of my job. I'm not going to help you. Everyone here is super 
super, super helpful. They will yeah. go out of their scope of responsibilities to make sure, like, if you don't understand this, I'm open to teaching you. I think that's a great culture that we have here within Threat Connect, not just the DevOps team, but throughout the entire organization. You know, your voices and your opinions matter to your supervisors, where I've seen some other people have concerns like, oh, my voice is not heard. I'm just a number, yeah. the X, Y, Z number of people in the corporate world. No, it's very flat here, to be quite honest. Um, and if you share your opinion, a lot of people are actually surprised, like, oh, my gosh, they actually listened. They gave me the tools I needed. Like, this is actually a better company than I thought. But <laughs> don't realize until they actually see it in person. So. Well, it sounds like Direct Connect is really doing a great job with supporting their developing talent. And that's a, that goes a long way because a lot of companies don't do that, right? A lot of companies, they just throw you to the wolves sometimes. And, you know, to have that support staff and support system means a lot to someone from a mental health standpoint, too, because we all know getting into a new role, man, that's very, you beat yourself up, even though there's nothing wrong. Right, because I go to I go by the standpoint of like, no news is good news. If they're not bothering you, if they're not on your back, then obviously you're doing what they want you to do. But instead, the imposter syndrome and everything tells you better you better be ready because when they ask you this, you better not not know it. Because they're gonna fire you on the spot, so you better it's like chill, be all right, you know. So yeah, so I, I really like that uh, that you guys really have a support system. Mm-hmm. So um. So I'm going to move to the to second question, and I'm going to direct this at you, uh, Susie, first. Okay. Now, you know, let's talk about before, if somebody wants to work for Threat Connect, before they even get to the stage of, you know, having a conversation with the recruiting staff, um, they first have to, to get eyes on them, right? So if you can, tell us more about how developing talent can get your attention or the attention of other recruiters um, on your team on social media, as well uh, as have you look at their resume when they present it to you? Yeah. Um, from a recruiter standpoint, I will let you know if the only way you're trying to look for a job is by submitting an application, good luck. <laughs> good luck. You have to understand the reason why I say this is companies receive over 500 to maybe thousands of applicants. You are another piece of digital paper in the applicant pool that you receive. If you're lucky enough where the recruiter is going through maybe some applicants or like resumes during that time you submit, you're very lucky. If not, you're probably on the bottom of the list and they will never look at your resume. That's just the scenario. Um, I think with social media, you just need to be more proactive, whether it's networking, whether it's connecting with people on LinkedIn. LinkedIn is such a powerful tool. Brian can speak to this again, (laughs) but it is such a powerful tool. You can connect with different individuals, even though you may not know them on a personal level. Most people are kind enough to maybe direct you to the right person or connect you with their network, et cetera. With the pandemic right now, yes, networking, you know, events are kind of hard to go to, but you have virtual events. You have her like virtual happy hours. Um, you know, just like a lot of events out there. If you just do a simple search, even on Google, you will find them all out there. But for resumes, I'm going to go into that, right? It takes a recruiter around seven seconds to look at your resume and they will decide to pass or maybe give you a chance to look further into your resume. So you have a few seconds to shine. Please always remember that. We are not going to spend hours and hours reading every single thing on your resume. Um, So what I look at at a quick glance is your experience. Of course, if it's, let's, we're talking DevOps, so we'll talk about DevOps, right? So I'll look at your experience related to DevOps what your roles were, what your responsibilities are, what your current skills are, if you have any like results or achievements that you've also accomplished. And like on a basic level, is your resume easy to read? Do you have spelling issues? Do you Mm. have good formatting? Like Mm. is there good consistency or is there inconsistency? Are like the dates of your tenure like off? Like, did you say you stopped working in September and then the next job it says you actually started working a new, new job in May? That doesn't match up. Um, stuff like that. Relevant language. Yes, buzzwords are great, you know, but can you speak to it? Stuff like that. <clears throat> um, of course, once again, I look at gaps. 
in your resume. I look at your tenure as well. Are you a person to jump ship constantly? Yes, money is great. And I understand <clears throat> that the best way to probably get a raise is going to a new company, right? Mm -hmm. But if you keep doing that, it's not the best fit. Here at Threat Connect, we're looking for people that aren't just looking for a job, but a long-term career because we're on that strategic growth path. We want people to stay with us for a very long time. Our average tenure is around five years or so. We're not looking to invest in you for you to stay three months or maybe just a year. Just saying. Um, and then also other than that, like personal footprint, do you have your portfolio on there? Do you have your GitLab on there? Sometimes I will check it out. You know, if your resume piques my interest within that seven seconds or so, if you don't have one, it's totally fine. Um, and then, you know, other stuff is general logistics. Can you work in within the U.S.? If this position is on site, are you able to work in that desired location, stuff like that. It's actually a very interesting relationship game that you can play with resume. <laughs> Sorry. But yeah, like some extra tips that I probably recommend is sometimes I see photos on resumes. I don't knock down brownie points, but I usually don't suggest adding a photo. Um, I think just in my phone screen stage two, I purposely don't have video calls. Um, and I don't like to meet them in person. And I have a phone call because I don't want my conversation with the candidate to be biased in any way. I really mm -hmm. want to see is this person qualified for the job just because they are, not what they look like, you know, what they smell like, et cetera, right? <laughs> Other than that, but don't add personal information like your weight, height. Right. <laughs> People do that. Well, it's kind of funny. The reason why I go over this common sense to some people is actually not common sense to others. So yeah, you actually yeah. want to reiterate and just be empathetic in the fact that not everyone understands how to create a resume. So I just like to throw that in there and be fair to everyone. But you know, don't include your high school information. If you had a low GPA, <laughs> don't include that. Don't re include unrelated work experience. Those are things that don't really matter on the resume. It's going to take up space. Don't make your resume 26 pages long if you only have two years of work experience. You didn't do all that in 26 pages, you know, stuff like that. Um, <clears throat> I know this is a little long, but I think this is all important. So I'll just talk a little bit further into this. But some extra tips, too, is when you're making a resume, yes, one general resume is great but you always want to have different resumes. And the reason why I say that is depending on the job you are applying for, please take your time to read the job description. And when you are writing your resume to tailor that position, have the most relevant experience that's tailored to the job at the top of your bullet points and have it match their job description to show the recruiter like, hey, you're looking for X, Y, and Z. I did X, Y, and Z and show it at the top. It should never be at the bottom of your resume of your experiences or skills that <clears throat> you have done. Um, and then general information, if you wanna also add in a cover letter, I think that's a great touch to also add in like, hey, these are the reasons why I'm interested in your company. Um, some people will read it. I think it's great, especially if someone put in time to write a cover letter for their application. I will take the time to look at their cover letter after the couple seconds of interest if it does peak it. Also a tip fact, when you are submitting your cover letter, please make sure that the name of the company and the role on your cover letter matches what you're applying for. <laughs> if, if, if you copy and paste, make sure you verify things because we see, we see it all the time where people have copied and pasted cover letters or resume and, and you can see where the font changes and you can see where sentences just end mid word and, and it's very obvious in these cases. It's bad, it's very bad. I've qualified great resumes because their cover letter, the information on their cover letter did not match the position they apply for. Wow. And the reason, because if you look at that job description, one skill set that we required is someone who is detail oriented. Mm -hmm. But if you can't take the extra five seconds to change the company name or make sure that, you know, the information on your cover letter is correct, you're not qualified <laughs> for the job. So it's different small reasons as to why certain people are disqualified. And I don't think certain people understand it at times. Um, so if you if you're a candidate that actually replies back to me, 
Um, Because I think communication is super important. So one thing in my recruiting department that I usually like to be vocal about is whether they are being considered or not, let them know and don't wait too long. You know, no one wants to be ghosted. No one wants to know like what happened. I never heard back from a certain company. But if a person takes their time to respond back to me and be like, I want to know why I'm not being considered, I respect that and I will, I will reply to hopefully give them advice in their next position to not make the same mistake again. Or maybe my two cents will maybe help. But yeah, just something you want to keep in mind when you're looking at a resume. Yeah, and let me ask too, because I know it was, uh, we were actually on a thread on, uh, I forget whose post it was, but what about thank you letters? Yeah, so I... <laughs> <laughs> um, I think it's great. I don't necessarily think it's important to send it to like, a recruiter that you're having a phone screen with, but if you do, I think it's always a nice touch. It's a traditional nice touch is the way I like to put it. But <clears throat> anyone else in the interview process that you're speaking with, I think it's always great to send a thank you letter. Um, and it doesn't need to be, you know, essays long, you know, it can just be a brief, brief paragraph, but Thank the person for their time, you know, for speaking with you. Reiterate why you think you'd be a great fit for the role. Um, <clears throat> and then maybe like a couple points that you took away from the conversation that you had with them. You don't want to copy and paste the same thank you letter to everyone you met in the interview process either, right? So just switch it up just a little bit. Um, and the reason why I say that is if there are two great candidates, A and B, I'm pretty sure the one that sent the thank you letter will probably get the position. Mm. Yeah, she just dropped. <laughs> Justin <laughs> seems indifferent. <laughs> yeah. so, and, and I think this kind of highlights just the differences in personality. Um, yeah. Because cover letters to me, they're you know on, at a scale out of ten, on a scale out of ten, they're a perfect five. Um, I've had some candidates where I've gotten cover letters, and some where I haven't. And I've hired some that have sent a cover or a thank you letter. I'm sorry, a thank you letter. And I've had I've hired some that haven't. Um, exactly. And you did, you did. <laughs> yeah. but if, if I'm being perfectly honest with you, the, the thank you note wasn't the determining factor in whether we hired you or not. Mm-hmm. Um, in general. So I, I will say this, uh, Susie and her team do an amazing job of filtering out probably 95% of applicants that we get, um, of the 5% that we get, I'll probably filter down another 1% or 2% and actually speak to um, maybe 3 or 4% of total applicants. But I will say one thing that I will give Susie and her team is they do review every single application that comes in. And I can not I can say that that definitely doesn't apply, you know, if you're applying at a large firm, uh, you know, any, any kind of big international corporation, for example, you may get filtered out by a robot. And, you know, I... Mm. There are benefits and drawbacks, and, and you can say good and bad about that, but that is something that I will absolutely give give Susie and her team a lot of credit for, is that they, they review everything. Um, I think it very much, for myself, the primary things that I'm looking for are, number one, can you effectively communicate your technical skills? Mm-hmm. Um, I don't want someone, I think Susie mentioned this briefly about don't have a 26-page resume. Um, as someone who comes from an engineering background, I can look at your resume and see if you've got a half a page of bullet points and paragraphs for a six month position, you're not talking about the things that you yourself did. What you're doing is you're padding out your resume and talking about everything that everyone on your team has done. Mm -hmm. Um, Some specific things that I will say, if you're in a contract position, which is very common for IT uh, individuals, make sure you note on your contract, uh, on your resume that that is a contract position. Um, You know, a six month, uh, six month stint at a company for a contract is 100% understandable. You know, I'm not going to fault someone who was a contractor and moved from position to position for six, eight months, a year at a time. You know, if you didn't and you claim to be a full-time employee, that's going to raise a little bit more of a red flag. As Susie said, we like to invest in our employees at Threat Connect. We like to make sure that we have people that want to be with us for a longer time period. Um, I see in the chat, uh, uh, Krista has a question of if you have a gap in your resume, how do you explain it? And, just speaking for myself as a hiring manager, and I'll acknowledge that there's a recruiter that most people will typically have to go through first. I'm a human. You know, I, I, I understand if you have to take time off for, you know, the pandemic and you got laid off and it took you six months to find a new position, you know, or 
you know, maybe, uh, you know, women in particular took some time off to be a stay at home parent or, or men to be fair. Uh, you know, an individual took time to stay off, say to stay home and be a stay at home parent. Um, you know, or any of a million other reasons, health issues, personal issues. Um, you know, those are all perfectly reasonable explanations. Um, the thing that I'm looking for is as you are preparing to reenter the job market, what are you doing? How are you trying to reintegrate yourself? How are you trying to get back into the job market? Are you taking these things that I know um, that uh, that, they, that they're teaching you guys to do? Uh, you know, Brian, for example, had a slew of Medium articles. He has an active GitHub page or GitLab, uh, GitHub page. I'm sorry. Yeah. You know, these are the kinds of things that as a hiring manager, if you're trying to reenter the job force, I'm going to be looking out for. Mm-hmm. Or changing right. careers. The same applies for changing careers as well. Right. Yep. Yeah. And to add on, um, our company, too, we've hired people with gaps in their resume. And one of our core values is integrity. So whatever the candidate is telling me their reason is, I will believe them. But don't lie about it later on and let me find out. You know? <laughs> but, <laughs> yeah, that slack, that slack will be going off. <laughs> yeah. Um, but also, too, women and... I wouldn't just say women, any individual that maybe, you know, take time off for their family, maybe newborns, anything like that, should never be ashamed of their gap to attend to their family. Our company here is very family oriented. So we have a lot of flexibility here as well, too. And yeah, just I'll just say people in general shouldn't ever feel ashamed or worried like, Am I falling behind in my career just because I'm attending to, you know, family situations no right now we're at an opportunity and an era where people can definitely take time off for mental health family newborns adoptions etc and then come back into the world when they are ready um i don't want ever anyone to think that it is a huge negative impact on their life there are companies that will overlook that and be human beings about yes crap goes on in the real world and you have to attend to it. And then when you're ready, you come back and there are people that are willing to take you in and really invest on you as well. Now you guys are giving so much value. So I want to look, I hope you guys taking notes once again. <laughs> and I will say this, if you guys are, if you think this is valuable information, put the TCs in the, in the chats. TCs, let me see the TC, 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 TC. That's what I'm <laughs> And, and look, while while we're at it, I gotta give credit to to Level Up and Tech and 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 brought us this program that I went through. Okay, I remember saying to Broadus, you know, I'm not gonna message recruiters. I'm not. I, I, it's an uncomfortable space for me. I guess I know what I was talking about. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I remember I ignored them the first couple of times, and then once I gained a little traction, I was like, "All right, man, you might know what you're talking about." And uh, I started posting medium posts, and I made one the other day, um, and I think I got like nine thousand views so far. So that's nine thousand people that are looking at me posting. If I was a prospective, you know, uh, applicant at this point, you know what I mean, I would have nine thousand, ten thousand, you know, eyes on me to say, "Hey, look, he's looking for an opportunity," you know. And then they might message me. It's no, I mean, y'all, I've told this story before, but so many people prior to me getting a role at Threat Connect have messaged me to try and help me out and, and get me interviews and, you know, just, just everything, just LinkedIn and making sure you put yourself out there are just, are just so vital. Um, and, you know, I kind of want to transition now, if y'all ready to transition uh, brought us. Yeah, I will definitely say for those, if you guys have questions, please put it in the comments. We'll try to get to it at the end of the chat. Yeah. But just any questions you have, feel free to go ahead and roll. So you want to yeah. roll with this question, brother? Yeah, I got you. Um, you know, some some folks don't have any production level experience. Justin, this is going to be probably more for you, right? Um, people are like me; they didn't have a lot of production level experience. Okay, I'm labbing in my own environment, which. Is also another tip for y'all if y'all didn't grasp that. But what does it really take to, you know, show you or any other DevOps hiring manager? Um, what does it really take to solve problems? What type of attributes do you look for, um, you know, when you're discussing, you know, with the candidates? 
This is this is the ever constant catch twenty two of finding a position. You need experience to get the job, but yeah. you need a job to get experience. Yeah. Um, I think in in this particular case, um, the the especially if you're transitioning from another career, far and above, I want someone who's showing that they're actually interested in transitioning into a tech related field. Um, you know, write your medium articles, write a GitHub, uh, write a GitLab, uh, you know, have a repository that you're actively working on, not something that you committed to once two years ago and then you haven't touched. Um, you know, pursue certifications. Um, I think when, you know, one of the big selling points for you was, um, you know, when, when we looked at your resume in the span of like eight months, you had had five different certifications on top of several different medium articles. Um, you know, these are, these are the kinds of things that we're looking for. Get a home lab, you know, buy a, a cheap uh, server, um, you know, and, and run it in your apartment. If you can't do that, look at other options. You know, Raspberry Pis are 40 bucks a piece. And if you throw in an SD card, it's 60 bucks on top of that. You know, they have, um, you know, they're, they're Kuber, you know, you can run Kubernetes on a Raspberry Pi. You're yeah. not going to get a lot done, but you can run it. You know, all of these are different things that you can use to show that I'm not just submitting uh, resumes for the sake of just trying to submit resumes. I am actually interested in pursuing and taking steps into this field because the honest truth of it is that, number one, DevOps on the whole is largely a, a, sec, a, a step up from basic system administration. And that can be a little bit demoralizing. There is an expectation in DevOps that you know some basic Linux administration. There is an expectation that you know how to operate in a command line environment. There is an expectation that you know how to use something like Vim or Emacs. Um, and what a lot of coding boot camps especially will do is they'll just show someone how to put out an IDE, you know, and use that to code some Terraform configuration files, and then that's it. And we get those people, you look at these applications, and you're going, okay, but now I've got to put you in an on-call rotation where you're the only engineer running at midnight, and now all of a sudden you've got an alert in. How do you handle it? Where do you go to find the logs? Where do you go to find all of these different things? Um, you know, um, and I think, so that's part one, but then part two is the attitude. Do you show an aptitude for troubleshooting? Do you show that you're someone who is able to take a log um, and and find what the issue is. Are you someone who's just looking to fill out a ticket and just sign off at the end of the day, or are you looking to pursue a problem to its root resolution, to its to find the actual underlying cause of the problem? Because if I want to hire, I, you know, I, I don't have the space or the time to bring in people that just they want to fill out a ticket and they want to you know do the bare minimum and then they're going to go home at the end of the day. Now you have to balance that a little bit, but but that is those are the kind of the two things that I'm really looking for and would really strongly suggest that people work on is they're looking to transition into a DevOps role. That is awesome. So yeah. Susie, I know you're not technical, right? <laughs> but you know, me, I'm not technical. <laughs> I mean, well, you're not in the technical role. I'm sorry. I, no, you know, no, no, no. <laughs> do you have anything to add to what Justin said? <laughs> yeah. So I agree with what Justin says. For Threat Connect, we don't have a lot of junior or entry level positions in engineering, to be quite honest, just because we're not totally of a large enough company yet. So we need people to start running off the ground, basically, mm -hmm. when they're in the positions. But for particular teams, we do have some junior level positions that do come up and we have opportunities like that. Other than what he did say, and I'm all for what he said, because those were things I was going to talk about as well, too. But other than that, show how passionate you are. You can definitely tell how passionate someone is in the things that they've been doing. For example, Brian, for example, in that short amount of time with a full-time job, he didn't have excuses and he still went for it. It shows how much drive he has as an individual. And that's a lot of mental, like, that's a lot of mental power that a person needs to get through. So those qualities that I saw from what he was doing so far, especially in his resume, we chatted a little bit as well too. I was like, this guy knows what he wants. 
if he sets his mind to anything, he can do anything. Those are the tangible <laughs> things that we are looking for here at Threat Connect. We're not, like Justin said, we're not looking for someone that's just like, oh, I need a job. I guess DevOps. Eh, why not? No, we don't want people like you here at Threat Connect, right? We want people that are just, they love what they're doing, they live, breathe what they're doing. Everyone here at Threat Connect is super passionate about what they do, right? And they're all very driven people. Very, very just, I don't know how to describe, just out of the world type of people here. And that's the type of where, sorry, that's the type of people we're looking to hire here at Threat Connect as well. Yes, great if you can do the job, but is it just the job that you do or do you like really live by it? It's the difference. And and I will say this is this is going to be very different depending on what um, depending on the company culture that you're looking at uh, where you're mm -hmm. applying. It's going to be very dependent on the size of the company. Mm -hmm. You know, you're you talk about your Fortune 100 that maybe have 20,000 employees spread across the entire world, and maybe that's not the kind of person they're looking for. You mm -hmm. know, um, I've come from previous companies where we pay you to make a widget and you're just there to stamp the widget and that's it. We just pay you to stamp the widget. Don't think about how you can improve the stamping of the widget. You're just making widgets and nothing else. Um, that's not something that I enjoy doing personally and professionally. And so that's something that every applicant needs to consider themselves. What kind of, what kind of a company culture am I looking for? Am I looking for somewhere where I can dive in and just do my one role and get really, really good at it? And as long as I'm within my box, then I'm safe. Or are you looking for somewhere where you could be working on Python today and then tomorrow you're, ha you're handed some a Helm chart and told, hey, make Grafana work. Um, <laughs> and then the next day you're trying to fine tune a Postgres database. And then the day out, like there's a hundred thousand different places that you can work at. And every single one of them are going to have a different company culture. So one of the more, so one of the bigger things that you can do is you're looking to enter this field is to be introspective and, and, you know, try and figure out what it is that you're looking for in your place of employment. Yeah. Totally agree. And I, and I would say, while you're on the journey, once again, I, I say this every call, while you're on the journey, especially if you're developing talent and you're looking for your first role, you're going to feel like you're not good enough. Mm -hmm. Yes. You're going to have the fear of the technology and the anxiety of, will I be able to learn this? Mm -hmm. yes. You're going to feel like you're going to want to quit 150,000 <laughs> million trillion times. Don't quit. Come understand how you can. So if you're using uh, your own tech stack, let's say if you're using Terraform, or even Ansible, whatever the case may be, and you're trying to do a project, understand this. Why are you using Terraform over any other IAC tool? Right? Why are you using Terraform over CloudFormation, which is AWS specific, if you're in AWS? Why are you using Ansible over, let's say, Puppet? Mm -hmm. being, being able to understand the pros and cons of the tech that you pick and you work with and, under, and defend why you're using them. Mm -hmm. Right, because you won't, you want to be able to go into in, into depth about what you've been doing, and if you're looking to let's say apply and, and connect with somebody like Susie at Threat Connect and try to land a DevOps engineer role, well, first thing you need to do is understand what Threat Connect does. Right, research the company, understand how are they solving problems. Is YouTube the problems you're trying to solve, and if so, how can you present? that you're solving or you on a track to solve problems similar to what they're doing in the production environment. If you're on the right track and they understand your thought process of, okay, Brian, tell me, you know, if you had a situation with something messed up, whatever the case may be, tell me how you fix that situation. Mm -hmm. They're really looking at your thought process. What is the first thing you do? Second thing you do, third thing you do, fourth thing. Because if you already have that process and you've been doing it, then it should come just like that, right? If you have to Sometimes even you got to think about it. You can easily say, well, let me let me think about how I would handle that situation. But you can also say, well, I know in previous times what I've done is this. Because they know you've done the work. They can easily sniff out, excuse my language, the bullshit. Don't come to the interview trying to lie. Oh, yeah, I, I, I 
I did that before. <laughs> you know, no, we could easily sniff out the bullshit and you will literally kill your chances of going further and even reapplying to another position if it comes over. Yeah. So, and you're going to be asked that question in almost every single interview about yeah. troubleshooting and your process in troubleshooting. It is one of the root questions I have always gotten in any interview um, that I was in is, you know, tell me how you troubleshoot. I'm in my own environment. How many problems can I have? As a new engineer, you'll be surprised how many errors <laughs> that you have and the unique errors that you can find that no one else has. So. But, and those unique errors, I believe, are not challenges to get frustrated over, right? What they are is when you, you're trying to learn, you can use those errors and say, you know what, this is an opportunity that, that I can try to fix and solve a problem that maybe if I walk into a role, other people in that role may not even encounter this yet. Yeah. And yeah. I can help somebody and bring that value that way, right? Yeah. So yeah. I, I want to, if anybody has any, well, first of all, once again, if we're giving value to you, drop those TCs in the comment, please. TC, I want to see TC. Go ahead. Before we move on, Broadus, I did want to. I did want to uh, jump back to a couple of different things that you that you talked about there. Uh, number one was imposter syndrome. Um, yes. You will encounter that for the rest of your technical career. It does not matter how high you go. It does not matter how far you go. Yeah. That is something that you will encounter for the rest of your technical career. It is impossible for one person to know anything or to know everything about any single technology much less the dozen <laughs> different technologies that we touch on any given big daily basis. Yep. Y'all see my wife down there in the comments, Justin, that's because about a week ago, I was like, oh my God, I hope I can learn all of this. I hope I can. <laughs> so that's why she's down in the comments down there with my name with the loudspeaker and broadest. I called him up. I was like, man, look, I got to hurry up. I got to do this. Cause if I don't, you know, and oh my goodness. Yeah. <laughs> Yep. But but any good manager worth their salt is aware of that, is aware of the fact that imposter syndrome is a thing and is going to encourage you to get through that. Any yeah. good manager that is looking out for your best interest is going to say, OK, that's all right. Let's learn. Let's do. Let's improve. Um, one of the favorite questions I like to ask when I'm on uh, interviews is what does DevOps mean to you? Uh, and for me personally, one of the core fundamental aspects of that is the concept of iteration. You're not looking to create the perfect technical solution on day one. That is the whole part of a minimally viable product. You want something that works, and you iterate that, and you improve on that. And yep. that applies to you as an individual as well. You're not trying to be the best you tomorrow. Make tomorrow that much better. And then yep. to the day after that is that much better. Um so definitely wanted to circle back on that. And then also about the troubleshooting. Um, another favorite interview question that I have is, tell me about the time you broke production. Because in addition to the troubleshooting, and, and to be fair, I recognize that that may not necessarily apply to all of this audience. Mm -hmm. right? If you're coming from a non-DevOps uh, position or a non-technical position, maybe that doesn't necessarily apply entirely. But you can talk about if you've done these things, if you've written your articles, if you have a home lab or a virtual lab, you can talk about some of those things. But what I'm looking for are, number one, do you have the integrity to admit when you mess up? We've all made mistakes. I have had that moment in my career, and there are some people out there that would say you're not really a DevOps engineer or you're not really a system administrator <laughs> until you've broken production. Um, you have that moment of, oh, crap, I just took that service down. Okay, how am I going to fix it? You know, did you admit to your mistake? Did you notify the relevant individuals? Did you say, did you get the necessary people on the phone, on the call, on the, you know, the bridge call or whatever? Did you message them on Slack and say, hey, I broke it. Here's what I did. Here's the command I was trying to fix or was, was trying to run. Here's the ticket number. I'm waiting on the system to reboot now, or here's where the backup process is. And then what did you do after that fact? Did you write documentation? Did you put it in your company's wiki? Did you put it in your individual repos readme file? Did you take a note that said, here's what I messed up. Here's what the fix is. You know, those are the kinds of things that I'm looking for in addition uh, as well, in addition to just the troubleshooting process, or, you know, the integrity as, as Susie alluded to previously. Yeah, man, that is exactly, we're giving you the, 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 the gems on exactly what you need to do. They're literally giving you the blueprint of what it takes to be a DevOps engineer at ThreatConnect. Now, uh, we got a few minutes left. I want to, if anybody has any questions, please put your questions in the comments. We're more than happy to answer. Um, 
And you just know why you guys are doing that. We all have been there, right? Like where you are right now trying to learn and you're feeling like, you know, oh, my God, am I going to be able to just really get a job? Yes, you have to keep going. Think about it. The great analogy I use is think about, like, if a person is trying to lose weight and they have the imposter syndrome, I'll never be able to fit in those jeans again. I'll never get to my high school weight. But if they come to the gym every day and then they eat well every day, mm-hmm. and even if they don't feel like it, right, they want a burger. No, you're tired. No, come to the gym and just get it over with. Eventually, they go go and put that shirt on or those jeans and be like, oh, snap. Like, I'm about to be, oh, that's yeah, how that's the, this that's process the, is. That, that's the key because, I mean, look, I'm married with three kids. You know, I put in 11, 12 hours a day. And I remember, brought us when I first started off, you said, man, you're doing too many hours. And I was like, man, if I don't do this, you know, <laughs> it might take me forever to get it. You know what I mean? Uh, and I remember the 1 a.m., the one thirty mornings, and I'd have to get up at 6 to go to work or whatever it might be. And my wife would be like, you still up? I was like, yeah, I got to fix this error. I cannot go to sleep until I fix this error. And uh, in turn, what it did is it ran, it ran its long, long course. Um, and thankfully... Thankfully, to sacrifice any of my students, if you're listening right now, when I get on you, if you're not doing what you're supposed to be doing or not ignore what you have going on outside, I'm just trying to get you to push past and understand that if you want to land a role within X amount of time, you have to put that work in in the time that you have. I can't help that I'm 34 and I started, you know, when I was 33, you know, you know. 2020, whatever. Okay. It's 21 now. I'll be 35 this year. But, um, you know, I, I, um, I just can't really emphasize that enough is if you're going through something outside, you have to make time for this process. Yes. You know, it's just, we're all, most of us are all adults that are in our program, um, you know, with family. So just keep pushing, push through. You, you'll get to the goal. Yeah. I did yeah. want to also say, H, no matter how old you are, it's never too late. Mm-hmm. Um, so don't ever feel, you know, inferior or maybe insecure to maybe those who may be younger than you, who maybe have more experience. No, any time is a great time. You just need to get started and put your mind to it. Just and have, yeah, like a negative mentality, throw that out the window. All right. <laughs> Whatever you think in your mind is what becomes true. So have great positive thoughts. If you are still looking for a career right now, don't, like I said, don't just send resumes, okay? Think outside of the box. Step outside of the box. Find creative ways to get in touch with the person that is the gatekeeper to that position or maybe your future opportunity, okay? For example, if well, okay, pre-pandemic or now, I guess, post-pandemic wise, go to the office. If they're close by, you bring them donuts. Try to catch that person. Give them the resume on hand. Who is not going to look at your resume if they are handed it to them, right? Think of creative ways to get in front of people. That's how you are going to be noticed. If you sit back and wait, good luck. Your chances are going to be very slim. Be proactive. Do something. No, that's awesome. Because think of what Susie just said, right? It brought me back to these days. I was a former musician. So think about it this way. If you were a musician and you wanted the label to hear your music, how would you do it? How would you get in contact with that gatekeeper to let them listen to your demo? Your resume is your demo, right? What you've been doing is the creation of music. So if you want to talk to Susie and have Threat Connect look, listen to your demo, How are you going to do it and be different doing it? How are you going to creatively catch their attention? That's how you got to think. And I I believe like everyone here from Threat Connect has given you what you need to do to be able to be a DevOps engineer. At Level of Tech, we show you how to do it. You guys have one goal. You want to get a role, right? And sometimes you want to go from A to B and you don't even care how you get to B, but you need someone in your life to care and understand the process of how you get to B. Teach you the process. Trust the process. And if you guys are are really looking to make that transition, I suggest you click that button up top. It says, look at the transition. (laughs) Click here or even connect with me as well. 
and I'm going to put my uh, LinkedIn down there at the bottom. And make sure you guys check out ThreatConnect.com as well, because it's an awesome company. Like, Brian has spoken nothing but high, high regards with ThreatConnect and his team. And it seems like a team that's really pushing. Um, and connect with Brian, too, if you guys rather talk yeah, about it. Yeah. So Brian is really just in a position where they're just motivating and, and literally um, supporting him to become the best engineer that he needs to be to be able to help them solve problems and um, really handle and accomplish their mission. So um, somebody you asked, is TC still hiring DevOps engineers? Uh, we are not presently hiring. Um, we are uh, sorting out a uh, budget for the next uh, fiscal year at the moment. Um, and depending on how that goes, we, we may or may not be within the next uh, month or two. Uh, Will Hardison said, in the future, do you see Threat Connect posting remote DevOps roles? Uh, all of our positions are remote within DevOps. Um, so we've got uh, individuals that are uh, North Carolina. Uh, I think we've got, uh, let's see, do we have, no, I don't think anybody's in Virginia right now. Yeah, um, that's me. Brian. <laughs> okay, Brian, yeah. I'm sorry, Brian. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> trying to keep everyone straight. Um, most of our teams in North Carolina, we just had a, a member who uh, left us, unfortunately, uh, who was in uh, Florida. Uh, we've got one member out in Oregon. Of course, I'm in Texas. So we're, we're very, very spread out right now. Um, we are in the process of hiring uh, security engineers for a SOC team. So do feel free. Uh, do please. Yeah, do, do please check out uh, our, our, uh, our website there and, and you can apply to that position. ThreatConnect.com. Get on right. it right now if you need that. Will, Will is one of my students that asked that. So, Will, you, you get with yeah, me. Will, I'm, 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 yeah. Yeah. Will, is, Will is in the Army. He's, uh, He's one of my He's uh, a major with, with, with great leadership skills, man. I'm so proud of Will. He is. Oh, so, wow. Hey, one thing I want to double back around to really quick. I know we're about to uh, cut it off soon, but Susie said something very important, something that I dealt with early on in the program, something that my students still deal with right now is when you first start, if you constantly think about failing, that's going to consume your mind, right? Mm -hmm. So you can't think about anything else, but oh my God, am I going to fail this exam? Am I going to fail at this project? Am I going to fail? If you do not worry about that, about failing, and I'm talking to this is me talking to you, somebody that did this. Um, you need to leave room in your mind to succeed, to absorb the information. Right. And you can't do that if you're constantly thinking about failing. Right. You, you know, you go, you invest in yourself uh, in your education and you say, God, what's going to happen if I fail? Well, you're just going to fail. And if you give yeah. up, it's going to be even worse. Yeah. And then you have wasted your investment. So make sure you leave your mind free and clear to learn the information, because in 20 weeks, in 24 weeks, it is a lot of information to learn. And sometimes it doesn't click till week 18, 19, 20. And then you can double back and be like, oh, my God, that's why I was learning Linux, because I needed to be able to securely log into an instance or I need to be able to check permissions or, or just, you know, do different things. Just simple navigation techniques and at level up in tech. Again, I think I posted a video the other week. The cloud certifications are sexy. Certifications are sexy. You, you, you know, they're there. Everybody wants to go get them right now. Um, but the operating systems and the foundations of where that stuff runs at is, is, is also, you know, just as important. I'm going to back Brian up on that. As as a, an engineer of six years now, there's not a day goes by that I don't learn something new. You will yeah. learn something new every single day for the rest of your career. And if you're not, then you're failing as an engineer. That's, you, should that's learn, you should be learning something new yeah, every, every day. Every day. I learn something every day. Let me tell you all that. So. Now, Jay said, uh, for the Threat to Connect team, what's the primary way that you have found success bringing junior people into your team? I'm working on changing how I bring people to my team, but I'm still trying to figure out a method for new people. You know, this is actually one of the initiatives that we are also working on other than um, just like the mentorship that we have right now for new people, not necessarily, I won't call them junior people, but for any new employees, our um, committee here at Threat Connect is actually working on a buddy slash mentor system for new employees. So in case you are 
if you think you ha- like have silly questions that you don't want to ask your supervisor because they might come off you know dumb or whatever, no questions are I think silly, but it'll be easier for people to transition and really understand their position or their responsibilities, etc. If they have a designated mentor, maybe a buddy that they can go to and ask for. Um, So I think that transition is actually great. Um, Other than that, for juniors, if you want to bring them on, I think it's up to the hiring managers, you know, if they have that capability or that bandwidth of bringing on people. If they are fast learners, great, that ramp up period is not going to take long enough. But you as a supervisor need to really understand, do I have the bandwidth and the time to really train someone, mold someone, et cetera? So I think you should think of that first. Do you have the resources to also train someone and mold them into who you want them to become? Um, There are other outlying factors that you want to maybe consider. Oh, she hope that was a gem for you to take, Shay. We appreciate that. Yep. Thank you. Good tips. (laughs) Well, um, we are out of time, guys. Uh, I want to say I thank everyone for coming to the call. I want to thank Susie. I want to thank Justin. I want to thank you, Brian, too, because you're representing Threat Connect to the fullest out here. That man working. I'm um, trying. I'm look, trying. You guys reach out um, to me or Brian if you guys have any questions. Um, and we will post the replay for this as well. So if you want, you have friends that need to hear this message, definitely share the link. Now, until next time, keep leveling up in tech. My name is Broadus, my co-host Brian, and we out. <laughs> Thank y'all. Bye. All right. See y'all later.